First things first, make sure all the doors and windows are locked and that there are no interlopers listening in because today we have the top secrets of compression finally revealed what they don't want you to know about compression. We're demystifying compression so that you can take your music to the next level. In all seriousness, there are no secrets to compression. There's really only techniques and there's functions and there's uses for what really is a not very difficult tool to understand. We live in this world where there are so many compressors and there's so much eye candy associated with them that I think that's the reason why you see so many videos on this topic and why it's something that it feels like it never gets old in terms of this specific kind of video. So I figured I might as well throw my hat into there too and do my video. But the reality is there are no secrets and the most disappointing thing to hear, especially if you're kind of new to music production, is that compression, it's like a learned skill. There are three things that I think you wanna try to remember though when it comes to compression. The first question you ask is, why am I applying compression? What is the purpose of this? So you might have a sound and you're like, ooh, I'm gonna throw a compressor on this. Well, you gotta ask why, okay? And if you don't have a good reason, don't put the compressor on there. The second question you wanna ask yourself is, is this the best tool to accomplish the job that I need to accomplish? So we now have things like transient shapers, multiband transient shapers, dynamic EQ, limiters, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there's all these different tools that now exist. And in many cases, those tools might actually be better to solve the problem that you're having, especially sample-based music, when all of these samples have already been processed to the extreme. The compressor, is not like the same tool that it once was. And it's easy to get tripped up into thinking that, oh, I need to apply compression everywhere, not realizing that that's not appropriate for the music that you make or the sound that you're going for. And then the final question or the final little factor is after you've applied the compression, did it actually accomplish the goal? So when you A, B it, you take it in and out, has it actually done what you wanted it to do? And that can actually be the hardest thing because I know for me, learning compression... Um, I didn't want to admit that I didn't know what I was like doing. And so I'd put a compressor on there and it would do something, but it wasn't really accomplishing the goal that I had set out. I was working on something recently and I tried six or seven different compressors on it. And this was on the master bus. And believe it or not, none of them sounded good. None of them worked. So I just didn't have a compressor on that master bus. But me several years ago would definitely have stuck to something and said, yeah, this is enhancing the sound. Those are the real secrets, unfortunately, and it's just experience and ear training. But hopefully as we go through this guide, maybe it can help you avoid some mistakes that you might be making or some assumptions that you might have, especially for those of you that do a lot of sample-based music. So let's jump into it and get started. Time for a quick review and just definition of what compression is. You can imagine a robot sitting at a fader and you've programmed this robot based on a certain number of variables to control that fader as signal comes in. And it can do it in a very precise, repeatable, expected way that you as a human being probably can't do. And just remember that back in the day before digital audio workstations, you couldn't draw in an envelope, but now we can. And just by drawing in this audio envelope, we can simulate what a compressor might do. So we could say that, okay, here's where we set our threshold. So it's at this point that we want to start compressing. How fast are we going to compress? How quickly are we going to do it? That's where we're kind of setting the attack time. So let's just go ahead and put it about to here. How sharp, how steep is this gonna be? That's gonna kind of relate to our ratio in some ways, but let's go ahead and let's like really compress this thing down. Let's bring this thing down like 6 dB. Okay, and you can see what it's done. Now, after it's done that compression and it's come down like so, we have the release stage. And the release stage might be boom, right away, or it might be a slower release. So we're gonna go with a slightly slower release time. We'll go right to about here, bring this back out to zero where we were. And essentially we have compressed this signal. Now it's more complicated than that. There's other factors. Sometimes things have like a dual stage, for example. So maybe... At this point, it's about almost all the way up. And then on that second stage, it's just taking a little bit longer. You also have things like curves, 
Okay, so there might be a different curvature to how the volume is being brought down and adjusted. It may be a different curve happening on the release stage. And then we'll just keep this a little bit more linear here. Okay, maybe we'll actually go and, and pull this 1.8 out a little bit further. Okay, and we have precise control over this. So remember that before the signal was peaking out at right around zero, let's take a look at it now and see where we're peaking out at. Okay, so we're now peaking out at minus 4.7. So we've done just about 4.7 um, degrees of gain reduction. And then we could make that back up by using something like a tool device, or we could even just go in here and overall bring the gain of this signal back up by taking all of these points. So let's just bring them up to about there. Let's see where we're peaking out now. That's a pretty fair comparison. And here we can now make our comparison. So we have our compressed with makeup gain versus our uncompressed raw file we brought in. For all I know, these things were compressed to begin with, but we've taken it a step further. So we can hear the impact and the punch that we're getting with this super digital transparent form of quote unquote compression. I mean, really, we're just drawing in a volume envelope, but that is what compression is. Now, keep in mind as we go through some of the following examples and we use an actual compressor, something where we don't have to draw in and add these little points and dots, um, that there's so many other factors and features that go into it. That's compression in a nutshell, and this is us doing compression in the most kind of literal sense. We're reducing the dynamic range in order to bring up the overall signal, and we can hear what that result is. What we have is a terrible piece of music that's going to be great for applying different compression and dynamics processing techniques where we can ask ourselves those three questions. Why do we want to use the compressor? Is the compressor the right dynamics tool for the job? And did it work? So we're going to be doing that. Let's take a listen to the little track that we have here, minus the vocal, which we're going to bring in and try to bring to the front of the mix. And when I listen to these various parts, I can just tell that these have already been processed very heavily. You're gonna watch a lot of tutorials and see people working with compressors on raw tracks, like raw mixes of real acoustic instruments, of an actual bass performance, a guitar performance, a raw vocal. And then when they, when they apply compression, you're like, holy crap, that's making a gigantic difference. When you're working with stuff that's already been sampled and been processed, you have to be really careful because your thought process and your mindset for applying compression is going to be different. And that could be a whole lengthy video. That could be a whole course in just thinking about how you're using processors based on the sound sources you have, but we don't have enough time for that. So let's bring our vocal on here. So the obvious thing here is that this vocal does not seem like it's been processed at all. And it's very hard to find samples like that. But we have some obvious things. Not only is this part significantly quieter, and that's something that we could actually address with just a little bit of volume automation, or in our case here, we could do um, clip gain. We could just bring that little section up. But we could also use a compressor. I don't want to completely have this part match this part um, because clearly it's a little bit quiet. It's more intimate for a reason. But the fact that this is being brought on in like this driving synth wavy style track, it's got to be matched up at least somewhat. And also just to smooth out some of the other words and things. And that's where something like the RVox is so good because it's just one knob. So let's bring that on now. And we're going to definitely have to adjust the relative gain here. Oh, baby, run, run. And again, there's no attack or release you set. This is like program dependent and it just does an amazing job on voice and it works almost every time as your starting out compressor. 
And so that's why it's on here. You can kind of go as hard as you want um, until it starts to sound bad. And so for me, that was right about that level. The next thing I added is something that you may not think to do, but I've done it. I'm trying to beef this thing up and make sure that it can be more just attached and quote unquote glued into the mix and beefed up and like more of the low end. So I brought on this sort of Fairchild style limiting amplifier. And these were some of the first style compressors to come into the studio. And they really were focused on attack and catching peaks. And that's why there is no attack control because it's a very quick attack that's reacting to the signal. Limiting, that's the key word there. So now when we bring this on, you're gonna see the key thing here is that we set our mix to 50-50. So when you're watching the gain reduction here, you're gonna see some massive amounts of it. Oh, baby, run, run, help me. Do you love me? I wonder, do you? So we can hear what it's doing there. If we put this all the way on, you're gonna hear the compressor working just a little bit too much and not in a flattering way. Oh baby, run, run, help me. Do you love me? I wonder. And what's the other thing we noticed there? Did you hear how when we hit that part? I wonder. Ooh, that just doesn't sound good. And so one thing I can do, and this is kind of going new school and old school all together, I'm gonna just grab those parts and kind of control them a little bit. Cool, I'm happy with that. Cool, so I'm happy with that. We just controlled those. Now I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna go and set my dry mix. Okay, and let's put it back in the mix. So you might be asking the question like, wow, why did you put this thing on and make it all muddy and boxy in the lower mids only to come in with another EQ and sweep that back out? And the reason is this is doing more than just building up that range. It's adding kind of a bulk and a girth and an analog warmth quality that I can then massage back in with another style EQ. This comes down to just kind of experience and knowing what I want to hear and knowing what I'm expecting. And that's gonna be true with these other final processors here as well. So we'll just add on the rest of these processors and then set the balance. Oh, baby, run, run. So there is our processing chain on the vocal, and those were the reasons why we applied the compression, and I think it did what I wanted it to do. So I'm very happy with the result of it. Obviously, I've done a little bit more processing there just to try to make it really kind of fit, and all in all, I think that's a pretty decent chain. Let's move on now to the bass part and just listen to it here first. So overall, I actually don't think this needs to be touched up too much. The only thing that worries me is that there's clearly some kind of a chorus or a stereo effect that I think is impacting the entire signal range. So just as like good housekeeping, we wanna try to center out the subs a little bit more and maybe even control those subs a little bit more and then let the higher frequencies be a little bit more free. So we can definitely use a compressor to control those subs just a bit more. And I don't even think we really have to touch the high end too much. So let's look and see what we've done here. We have a multi-band FX here and that's just now setting everything below 130 to mono. Oh, baby, run, run. And it feels like we're losing energy, especially if you're listening in headphones, but this is one of those things that it's gonna be a net gain at the end of the mix. So even though it feels like we're losing a little bit of energy, that's not the end of the world. 
Okay, and now in our mid-side split here, in the sides, we're actually just gonna be clearing away space for what's going on in the mid. So let's listen to this on and off, then we'll look at the processor. So really all this is doing is tightening things up. And here on the mids, we've added an instance of another sort of leveling amplifier, one that historically does sound really good on bass. And what we have is the ability to do some of this um, side chain EQ stuff, and that's then influencing how the compressor reacts or what it's not going to react to, what it might let just pass through. So for example, the high pass filter, we can let those really subby stuff come through and then control more of the low mids and just kind of level those bad boys out. And that's what we have happening here. So again, we don't have to set an attack or release program dependent based on what's coming in. Okay, so it's just kind of putting things more into a specific place. And that's what we want to do with these samples that have already been processed so heavily, is put things into a specific place. And hopefully life will be good. Let's take a look at the keys here. We have a mid-side split going on, and I believe in the mids and the sides, we're not doing anything. We're leaving those alone. In the mids, what we're doing is we are going to, and I'll mute out the sides here so we can listen to them. And you're saying, oh my gosh, he's taking away all this energy again. But the reason for that is that I decided that I would go and compress the mid signal of the keys because I am going to be taking away a bunch of energy from them to leave room for the vocal. And that's what's going on here. So I just have the regular old Dynamics processor here. This one's nice because you can use it in the classic sense of reducing dynamic range. And that's what we're doing with a super fast attack time, relatively slow release time at almost half a second. The attack time is 0.1 milliseconds. A little bit of knee control so that we're always compressing. And we can see the way that it's grabbing hold of this and just balancing it out. And then many people have seen me do this before. I have an audio side chain going on the EQ plus in a dynamic EQ fashion. And I'm leaving room for the fundamental of the vocal to come through and cut through the mix at that point. So let's listen to these brought on. Oh, I think I need to bring the sides back in. That would be helpful. So you can hear now, it feels like the keys and the vocals are working together. It's like the keys are kind of surrounding the vocal. And that's what I was going for. And that's why we have the processing the way it is. The bass sounds good. It feels not too full that it's going to again leave room for some of these other things. And then what we finally have are the drums to bring back in. So on the top drums here, all I have done is apply to track limiter where we are able to take out a ton of that peak information and not really influence the overall sound too much. So it's actually coming out quieter on a peak level. That's one of the things that I will commonly do is I will limit the peaks up to the point where I don't feel like it's losing too much energy because I know I'm gonna do more processing later on. So we have a limiter there on the top drums. On the actual drums, I've done no processing whatsoever because they're already processed so heavily. And then finally on the group, we have a little bit of processing going on where yet again, I've applied another limiter just to try to give us as much energy as we possibly can. This is now both of these parts going in. So we might even be relimiting those top drums. Let's take a listen and see how aggressive we've gone. Not, not crazy. So what's going to end up happening is we are going to be taking away some punch, but we can bring that back in later on and on the whole have lower dynamic range. And that's kind of the goal here with these drums to then fit them in with everything else. Next, we have a max volume. This is just going to bring up that lower level. Mm -hmm. 
And then finally, we are going into a compressor where you're gonna see these classic settings. And this is literally not only to glue these things together, but to bring back a tiny bit of the punch that we've lost from the track limiter. Slow attack, fast release, flirting with that 4 dB of gain reduction, tiny bit of makeup gain coming in, high passing on the side chain to leave those subs alone. And now we can mix everything back in. And after listening back to that, you know, it's funny, we come back to where we just were. The final thing I feel like I want to do is just add one dB of gain to that little section there just to make sure that it doesn't get lost. Yep, that's fine. I really wish that there was a checklist or a manual or something that I could provide you with that did give you the keys or the secrets to the sorts of compression that you want to apply in every scenario. But as you can see here, every situation is going to be different. The source material is going to be different. And that's what should be influencing your decisions about the compressor you're using. What we started with was something that sounded fine. And then when we tried to bring the vocal in, that was a problem for us. And we had to start applying dynamics processing. And then we did it in all these other places too, just to try to make sure that, you know, the vocal is fitting with the keys, that the bass is fitting with the drums, things like that. And that's the general idea. The final thing that we've applied is just a little bit of a bus compression. And this is a classic and it's a very simple little compressor. Oh, baby. And that one's literally on here just as a glue. As you can see, it's doing like one dB of gain and it's reacting to the vocal. So that's how I kind of set the attack and release characteristic. I didn't set it based on the drums, which might be your first instinct. Altogether, here's where we're at on the final. Oh, baby. And the crazy thing is like, that's not even a full mix. Like where there's so many other things that we could do, we would probably add like some kind of a throw delay on some of those final parts that you don't hear those aggressive cutoffs or whatever. But let's leave it there for now with dynamics processing. And this is in more of a mixed context. We're gonna just quickly talk about um, compression on individual parts or individual sounds. Here's an example where we're going to try to flip some of the preconceived compression notions on their head. So here's a snare sound we have. And to be honest, that thing is already super punchy. I can't imagine ever applying standard compression to a sound like that because it's already probably going to be cutting through. If, if I'm using any kind of dynamics processor, it's going to be a limiter. It might be some kind of dynamic EQ. It might be a multi-band transient shaper. It might just be regular transient shaping, whatever. But just standard compression probably isn't going to help this sound too much because it's already really powerful and really punchy. That being said, we're going to use four different compressors and kind of listen to it. When you're learning compression and you're still new to this whole thing, my recommendation is that you really only have maybe four compressors in your arsenal at the beginning and all very simple and easy to control. The less sweeping controls, the better, so it's easier for you to manage and to actually hear what the end result is and to know what you're doing versus just sweeping things around willy-nilly. So here's our first example where we're just gonna use a little preset that I've created here and we're gonna try some of these different settings. So we have a preset attack and release with one bit of modification on those. We have a threshold and then we have our auto gain and we have ratios. So let's put our ratio to four to one and let's just mess around with this. Our auto gain is deceiving us. It put us right over, even though it was coming out at minus six. All right, let's listen to the before and after.
Yeah, so I definitely prefer the version without the compression. This sounds like it's over compressed. And now here's another setting with the slower attack time, the faster release time, a little bit of a higher ratio. And this is going to accent the transient, but then if we gain match it, it's gonna bring the overall level down. So it's a no brainer, right? This compressor is not gonna work. Let's try going over to a channel compressor. So we are going to use the compressor here in this module, not really using any of the other modules. We have the preamp on, that should be fine, but nothing else is in play here. And let's see what we can do with it. We've got a ratio here around seven and a half, doing a decent amount of compression here. And this compressor, I think is supposed to be kind of program dependent. So again, we have the ability to go auto release or go with a faster attack. We also have the side chain filter turned on. And let's listen to this in and out. So here we are out. And here we are in. So again, out and in. It changes the tone, but I think I prefer the version with this not on. We could try the other settings. We could try the faster attack. And then we shouldn't be needing to decrease this as much. And let's see. Yeah. So yeah, so this one's not going to work for us. We could try other settings, but again, I don't think we're going to find anything flattering. So that's a no go. Let's try one of those like leveling amplifiers. Okay. That's definitely getting that snap to come through. But oh man, it's brought on a ton of gain. So we have to control that. Oh man, and it still has to go even quieter. So a lot of thwack to it. But that's a no-go for me as well. And then finally, we have something like the Brit Presser that has both a limiter and a compressor. But again, we have no attack control on the um, compressor portion of this. So it's hard for us to limit and then add punch back. So here's what it ends up sounding like. And that's just overly compressed and artificial sounding. So if I was gonna do anything to a signal like this, which I probably wouldn't do anything with, I'm gonna do the old classic standby of limiting and then trying to add some compression back in. So like seeing if we can have the volume actually end up being a little bit lower, but carry the same amount of weight and punch. So let's try that. Okay, so after all of that limiting, I'm now hopeful that I can add some snap and punch back in. So here is our end result, and we can listen to these off first, and then we'll turn them back on. They have been gain matched. And I can take it even a little bit further, it seems. Yep. So yeah, I would be cool with that if I, for some reason, needed a little bit extra. I don't know if I ever would. And obviously this tonal brightness control is playing a big role on the end result of the final sound. But there's a classic example of if I just use this on its own, it is not gonna be as powerful or significant. Don't assume that just because you've brought on a snare sound that you can immediately use an 1176 and it's going to be flattering to it. A few parting thoughts and things to watch out for. If you do work with a lot of synthesizers and you work with a lot of presets, be sure that you are checking the effects section of those for compression, limiting, multi-band stuff that's at play and consider turning it off and then trying to add your own compressors or limiters. 
um, just for practice and just for experience to see, oh, can I match what they got out of that synthesizer? Is that appropriate for my music? There's a lot of times where you do want to turn off those compressors or limiters and, and apply your own because it just makes more sense. And it comes back to that whole three factors thing of why am I applying compression? Is compression the best tool for the job? And am I able to actually get the compressor to work the way that I want it to work? Your source audio is really, really going to make a difference. What you're trying to accomplish is going to make a difference in the compressors you use, how you apply them, so on and so forth. Uh, the final thing, and I said it just a couple minutes ago that I'll reiterate, is if you are new to making music, bring in, add one compressor at a time to your workflow and just try it on everything. So for example, I would recommend some of the free ones from like, analog obsessions, just so you can get a feel for how these things respond to your dynamics. But something like this is a great place to start because all you have here are fast attack, auto release, you have the side chain filter, you have the ratio. Unfortunately, it doesn't give you labels. That would be nice if it did, but it's a very easy one to work with and you can see if it's flattering on the material that you bring it on. Anyway, I think that is where we're gonna leave things for now. If you have any questions, um, I do check the comment sections occasionally and try to get back to people, but otherwise just have a wonderful day and I hope you've maybe learned a thing or two. Take care.